All right, we're at time and already have 120 plus people joining with us. So I think in the interest of time, we'll get started. Um, hi, my name is Vanessa. I'm the Program Administrator for Bioimaging North America. Thank you all for joining us today at the Figure Making Breast Practices Workshop hosted by the BINA Early Career Working Group and members of CORA Lemmy Working Group 12. You'll hear more about those in just a moment. Um, we have two welcome activities. We'd love to know where you're joining us from and what are you hoping to learn in this seminar. So the two activities, the links are being shared in the chat. I'll leave this up for just a moment longer to maybe snap the QR code. Um, but we've got a couple announcements from Bina to share with you. So uh, if you are new to hearing about Bina, we have uh, two recurring events happening, um, a scientific speaker series. The next one will be on March 12th from Mariana Denise. You might know of her from her Focal Plane series featuring Latin American scientists, which is really wonderful. And she will be celebrating Women's History Month. So come join that exciting talk. Um, those recur on the second Tuesday of every month. So we hope you can join us for some of those. We also have a career speaker series. So that features scientists from a lot of, a wide variety of professions within the imaging field and join us to learn more about that. All the information can be found at bioimagingnorthamerica.org slash activities and you can register for all these events. I wanted to share a calendar view of those activities. So the scientific speaker series is on the second Tuesday of the month. The careers is on the, um, third Wednesday of the month. We also have a this, which you're at, the Figure Making Best Practices Workshop. Thank you again for joining us. And uh, we also have a community conversation that will be hosted by our Builders Working Group on March 13th. If you do any building or tool development, we'd love to have you join us for that. And then finally, um, we have another recurring event that happens on the last Wednesday of every month, which is our exchange of experience virtual group to come share about a wide variety of topics. They choose a new topic every month and get feedback from the audience for the next topic. So but consider joining us at that. And again, all the links are available at the links that uh, no doubt Nikki is sharing in the chat with you all. And with that, I will pass it over to Nikki to share a little bit more about some other events we have going on. Hi, I'm Nikki Bailey. I'm the program coordinator for Bioimaging North America and I want to make sure you know about our big meeting that's happening in September for those of you that are in the North American continent. And if you want to come to us from Europe, we'd love to have you. It'll be uh, an opportunity for some in-person interaction, but we do also offer this hybrid. So if you're not able to attend in person, you can register and participate virtually as well. And I wanted to also share about a couple of programs that Bina has to offer, uh, our professional development program that provides uh, registration support to attend many of the MBL and Cold Spring Harbor courses that are offered in the United States and also some courses in Canada, and also the exchange of experience, which is sort of like a job shadowing. If those of you from Europe are familiar with that program, it's a mobility program so that Bina members can go and spend some time, uh, generally up to about a week, in another member's lab, learning a particular technique, how they run things. It could be image analysis focused. It's, focused. it's uh, generally pretty broad. And for those of you who are not North American um, members in the audience, there are similar programs uh, in other networks. So Global Bioimaging has some very similar programs too that you can check out. And you can always contact us if you want to find out more about any of those at any point in time. Um, as I say, we're always happy to point you to other people in the community. And then finally, a big thank you to Venus Platinum sponsors, AVR Optics and Milteni Biotech um, with, with their support that we can offer many of the things um, that you will see visible on the Bina website. Um, and also they help us with our image contest every year. So we managed to run that every October, I believe it is. And so please keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, we give cash prizes for those. So on that note, I will pass it over to Mike Nelson um, and let him take it away for the early career work of working group. Thanks. Hi all, I'm Mike, a graduate student in the lab of Kevin Ellisary at UW-Madison. I wanted to start by acknowledging our co-chairs for the BINA early career working group, Natalie Wu and Quinn Lee. Uh, Quinn can provide a contact email address for anyone interested in joining the working group, so check chat if you're interested. And our early career working group and this presentation would not have been possible without the constant support of Vanessa and Nikki uh, from the BINA admin team pulling together everything from this entire Zoom event and participant capacity upgrades and the Padlet mentee polls and sending out all of these 600 responses to registrations and more. Uh, 
I'd also like to thank all of you who've taken the time to join us live. I hope you find this information useful and encourage you to fill out the polls about future events so we can keep this kind of strong showing and encouraging encourage community conversations about topics that are interesting to you all. Also, please uh, check out the Google Doc that can be shared by Nikki in chat for copies of the links that are going to be shared on the screen. Um, I'd also like to introduce Corp. For those of you who aren't familiar, it's an initiative born in the COVID years to improve the quality and reproducibility of microscopy experiments. It's grown from 120 people in nearly uh, in 2020 to over 600 members from around the world today. And it's not just scientists talking about what could be better either. We have an active community putting out publications like the one you'll hear about soon, and not only creating the publications, but also following through with outreach events like these to get the message out. So. If any of you are interested, uh, you can join, uh, you can search for Quora or check the links that were provided and sign up for any of a number of working groups that fit your interests. You can see there's a wide range of working groups from everything involved from the nuts and bolts of hardware to tracking and generating metadata to uh, sharing the, the end results of a project with the scientific community in a way that's approachable, interpretable, and scientific. And that's what I've been mostly involved with in working groups 11 and 12, and would like to just take a moment to thank the co-chairs of working group 12, Chris and Helena, for their hard work, without which I doubt we would be here today. And while we will be presenting the BioVoxel figure tools plus Inkscape workflow, these are absolutely not the only options. I believe Craig, the developer of Quick Figures, may be with us today in the audience, along with Kristen Gallick from our working group, who are both... Uh, responsible for and avid fans of the Quick Figures plugin, and they can potentially provide commentary and answer questions about that software in chat. Additionally, there's Figure J by Jerome Mutterer, uh, another prolific poster on the ImageSC forum. So there, these are all options, and if there's sufficient interest, we may want to hold another more hands-on workshop where we look at one or more of these. Let's see. So our first speaker today is going to be Christopher Schmid, currently the lead data scientist, lead, di lead data scientist at Ewing, and most importantly, at least to me, the co-chair of our working group 12 in Corp and the first author of our checklist publication. I'd like to thank you for both your uh, leadership and guidance during the sometimes intense discussions within the working group. Broker essentially is BioVoxel, an image processing and analysis consulting service. In addition, service in addition to the being the name of the Fiji plugin that he has created and maintains, he's a frequent contributor on both the ImageSC forum and in various open source events like Images to Knowledge and ImageSC Live Around the World, which is where I ran into him and requested that he join our session here because, let's face it, he's going to do a much better job at presenting his software and answering questions about it than I would have. Uh, uh, next slide. I want to emphasize that the... Uh, while these figure making tools can be used for a wide variety of purposes, we're just going to be looking at them today from the perspective of images collected by microscopes. Obviously, these are not the only types of images that exist in science, but they are the ones we're focusing on, where pixels and voxels define a set volume and the intensities represent the amounts of something being imaged. Um, we will likely be pressed for time, so please use the question and answer and chat functions to ask questions during the presentations. We'll be watching the chat and we'll try to address your questions as they come up. Um, and I'll try and keep track of any questions that are not answered for the Q&A session later. Chris, take it away. Good. Thank you very much. Uh... Michael, for the very nice introduction. Thank you uh, also for the invitation to this workshop and thanks to the organizer, Vanessa and Nikki, for this great organization. I am Christopher Schmidt. I'm a lead data scientist in the EU Open Screen. We are a uh, research infrastructure consortium concerned with screening. So we offer also services for uh, performing screen and with large compound libraries. It's where I'm currently work uh, located. And the work I'm, uh, today I will show is happening in Corrib Limi, work group 12. And uh, <clears throat> Michael really, uh, Mike really uh, nicely introduced uh, the, the work we did together. And I really enjoyed all the discussions there. So this was super uh, fun uh, project to be had. Um, so, as um, Mike already introduced to you, basically images, uh, microscopy images in particular here with this case, 
are scientific data, right? And scientific data needs to be treated in a specific way. Uh, it needs to uh, be presented also in a specific way. And I believe most of uh, us during our uh, education as scientists uh, got a good notion about how data, scientific data should be handled and should be presented, right? Uh, images and their analysis, particularly because a lot of images are now nowadays generated, and so they are also analyzed, should in publication then be accessible, they should be understandable. The images that we see should be representative of an underlying biological phenomenon. And uh, most of all, they should be also reproducible. So given this ideal scenario, then my uh, co-chair Helena set out and tried to um, figure out if the images in the publications are really living up to the standards. And when, how she did that basically was to make a survey of a, a sample of images, even in high impact journals. And for basically what she found is that many images are not effective in uh, communicating the scientific result. Um, particularly, she found that inserts are not correctly annotated or not annotated at all, that scale bars are missing, for instance, because uh, microscopy images, they are a representation of a physical object, typically. So the physical dimension is really key and the scale bar is very important for visualization. Uh, further on, in order to explain the images, you need uh, annotations and often these annotations were missing and also images were not prepared in a color blind friendly manner and figure legends were incomplete. And these were a significant amount of error. This is not uh, per se a severe scientific misconduct it's typically something that happens by accident and or not better knowledge. Uh, and that's what we basically uh, assumed underlying that uh, problem is that a lot of people learn this um, on the go by themselves or by being taught with their colleagues. There is no structured way of teaching this. And there on top of that, there is no clear instructions what to do, what is important in uh, images, in publications. And that's why we basically came up with this very simple checklist. Uh, and the content for us sh uh, should be uh, in this process, we decided to implement stuff that easy, is easy, easy to understand and easy to action upon. And for a broad scientific audience, because we didn't want uh, only microscopy expert understanding our content. We wanted to have a, a lot of people profiting from this material. So this checklist should be a sort of guidance for you to basically improve your Im images in publications to make them more understandable, reproducible and accessible. All of this was done in a, in a large community effort. That's, this is really was really important to us. And that's something Helena really uh, kept uh, pushing forward. It's, uh, it was an open, inclusive approach to this development, basically. And we immediately sought out feedback from our peers that are immediate surrounding. But we also then started over multiple feedback rounds to collect uh, feedback from the Quarabimi community and then approached many people uh, for reading this, our publications. So we bothered a lot of people over a very long period um, and sent out a lot of emails, right? Um, that, on the one hand, um, uh, enabled us to implement a large variety of different viewpoints, which I think really enriched the content. So we are very grateful for all these different perspectives um, that view this problem very differently. Uh, for instance, we cover four different continents in our authors, and we have represented this from different company. For instance, Zeiss was part of that. And then we have different leading uh, research institutes. I just put a number of on top of that. What I'm particularly proud of is that one uh, of our authors came from a NASA research center. So he basically circulated in this very unexpected uh, community 
uh, our checklist. So this was uh, super nice. So what is the content now specifically? And I break this down. You can then view basically this uh, checklist in the publication. That is, is a lot of content. Just to give you an overview, what are these checklists containing? First of all, they, uh, we talk about in the image publication checklists about image format, about image colors and channels, how to set that, uh, about image annotations. And we talk about what is particularly more and more important, the image availability. Further, and that was very important for me, is we also talk about image analysis and what we find particularly in publications is that image analysis is not well documented and represented. Therefore, I, we also included uh, image analysis checklists. We talk about uh, and give guidance on how to document and report in publications established workflows. So you just use a tool that is out there and uh, you just need to basically say a few things for people being able to understand what you did. Uh, we talk about aspects when you really develop a new workflow. And then we also talk about machine learning because that more and more becomes important in also in the application side and give you advice on that. What I will talk about now in more detail then is the image publication checklist, but this image analysis checklist exists too. So, and then there's a lot of advice that you can give to people, right? And we don't want to overwhelm you. We also want you to view this as an iterative process. And maybe uh, you don't need to be 100% perfect in this process, right? So that's why we broke down this checklist into diff three different levels. First of all is the minimal level, which we give uh, the really the baseline of what we expect uh, image uh, in a publication should be basically rich um, <clears throat> for being uh, publication material, basically. Then we uh, give you a recommended level, which we believe uh, increases the, um, <clears throat> the understandability of uh, images and also the reproducibility um, and helps you a little bit more to improve that. And then on top of that, we formulate the ideal level a situation where you can still improve basically the reproducibility of your images. However, uh, there is no expectation of to directly implement it. Sometimes it's too difficult for certain use cases, but it's maybe also aspects that are a little bit uh, beyond the horizon and still need to be a bit more practical. So that's something you can then, if you have more time, also focus on. So now what do these checklists specifically contain? What kind of content, what kind of advice do we give? First of all, we uh, talk about image formatting. How do you present the images? And particularly, what we think about here is the result, right? Because images, you want to communicate the result. Here, it's important to really focus on the relevant image content. And you, uh, we allow you basically, we tell you, encourage you to also prop rotate and resize, but within certain, uh, within reason, right? Um, as long as it represents the image content well, the result that you want to show and doesn't hide anything. Then it's important to, which is very simple, separate the individual image panels. If you have a quantification, we would like you to also show an example image so people have a better viewpoint of these quantifications if the quantifications came from images, of course. And then if you have a zoom or inset in your images, you should indicate the position of this zoom in the original image. And then what we also would like to ask you to show a range of described phenotypes, maybe in the supplements. So people have, it's not really often in publications, you it's a very highly selected process. We want this to be a bit fairer. Um, we talk also about image colors and channels. Here it's important that you annotate these channels because typically in fluorescence microscopy, these uh, channels have a certain meaning, they are staining or marker. More importantly, we also want to basically um, adjust the brightness contrast and report those and use uh, apply uniform color scales. We, for comparison, it's particularly important that you adjust the brightness contrast in a similar manner. 
For channel colors, it's important that they should have a high visibility on background. And here the best visibility is grayscale. For multicolors, maybe in the supplement provides grayscale for each color channel because uh, color perception is slightly different between different colors and the best perception uh, is typically grayscale. Uh, particular for intensity, for different intensity. Uh, and uh, multicolor, if the channels are merged, make them uh, accessible to the colorblind. So think about that there is a, a red green blindness and use uh, different uh, lookup tables. Uh, then for intensity scales can be provided for grayscale or particularly pseudo colors. If you have, that would be a recommended level now. And for ideally then, and this is the top level, right? Um, the pseudo colored image, you provide additional grayscale versions for comparison. And for gamma adjustments, you should provide additional uh, linear adjusted images for comparison. Image annotations are super vital to provide the uh, um, context for your uh, image figures, right? Here, it's really vital to add the appropriate scale information. So a scale bar or image length in the figure or figure legend. Um, you should explain all the annotations in your figure and figure legend to really make the readers um, being able to access the information in your images. The annotation should be legible. The annotation should not obscure key data. This is really vital. And if in more important uh, for a recommended level, then then the more details can be provided and that are important for the particular application. So this is a bit more specific to application. If it's a movie and a still frame from a movie, for instance, you can um, provide the frame, for instance. Then nowadays, uh, it's really vital for uh, you as an author or to make images available. And here, really, the important is to have the original microscopy image available also in the background. Really, um, and I it should be losslessly compressed. Uh, uh, but nowadays, and that's what um, this, it's very clear that this sharing upon request doesn't really work effectively. We really recommend to share images freely downloadable in a public database such as Tenodo. This is really easy to use, so uh, I have made very good experience. And if you want to improve upon that, because a lot of people are doing this nowadays, you can provide image files in dedicated image databases. So that's how shows gives you some recommendation of what to do. Um, how to do it will be explained to you uh, later on also. And I'm looking very much forward to this uh, great content that uh, Mike and Jan uh, provide. And what an alternative to um, the checklist basically that show you how to implement this would be also these cheat sheets that we uh, created, Helena and me created, and over the, that was our pandemic project. And so that should you give you some uh, help also to show you how to do it, particularly with Fiji. Be what we now as a community, we still are ongoing and there's a lot of interest and very thank you very much for showing this interest. This was really super valuable to us to see that really there's a need for people uh, having, needing more uh, material about this. And what we are currently working on as a work group 12 in an extension of this publication, of this Nature Methods publication, is this website where we try to collect more tutorials and teaching material for you, but that is still an ongoing project. Uh, with this, I then want to thank, this was a very large project and with many different members. And I want to really emphasize Helena Yambo, she initiated this group and was uh, a, the strong uh, senior co-chair here and drove this uh, community development really forward. This was really her achievement. Uh, Roland Nitschke is the founder of Corab Limi and obviously we need to, I need to thank a lot the people in work group 12, which was really super nice group with lots of uh, nice discussion. I want to thank also the HD Milan, which allowed me to start this project in the lab of Florian Hook. <clears throat> and the UCLAB, 
And I also want to thank then the FMP in Berlin, which allowed me to basically finish uh, the publication. And then I want to thank my current employer, you open screen, and uh, for allowing me also to uh, bring this message forward to other people. And with this, I want to close. And um, these are basically links to this nature methods paper. This is uh, free. In that sense, it's not completely free, but it's accessible for uh, people uh, without the paywall. And when you, if you want to get access to this uh, checklist as a printable sheet, uh, then you can uh, look at Zenodo there. We deposited this uh, checklist. And you can get in touch with us uh, in workgroup 12. We still exist and want to drive this home and make your life easier. Thank you very much. All right, Jan, all you, I think. And should I see? Yeah, so, this? okay, then. I hope everybody can see the screen. Um, so thanks for the invitation. Thanks for giving me also this platform to talk a little bit more about Christopher uh, introduced it, um, already very nicely in the overview. So I would say we get our hands dirty and uh, look a little bit at how we can manage that. First, a few introduction slides, and then um, I want to show you this more in a demo and keep the fingers crossed that nothing crashes. Um, so in principle, I don't have to mention more in my person. Uh, Mike gave already a nice introduction. If anybody needs more information, um, you can go to the BioVoxel homepage, biovoxel.de. Um, in general, potentially interesting for some um, that there are different workshops today. These 40 minutes are by far not enough to talk about all we would need to talk about, no matter if we talk about image preparation and figure creation or about image analysis. So if there is anything of interest, then get in touch with me and we can talk about it. So why? considers images so much um, because the images you publish are the showcase for your science. And if those images um, are of low quality, which unfortunately they often are in um, many published um, figures, then this might not rise a high um, confidence in the science which is actually um, published there. So this is why um, it's in your own interest to actually keep the quality of those images high and make it also, Christopher mentioned the word accessible. And also accessible also means if somebody zooms in your publication image and sees the pixels and sees the actual data, that is potentially the best final readout we, we could have. So without doubts that it's not perfect. No? Um, our images only reflect our experiments and you see nicely in this reflection that um, it's never showing the reality as it really exists. We need to basically work with those kind of errors. We need to live with it. We should communicate it. We don't want to make our images beautiful. We want to make our images transparent. That should be our goal. Um, and Therefore, spending a little bit of time in this might be uh, important. So what I personally and also others often see is that coming from the microscope, the stuff looks still very good. Ending up in a publication at the end, there might be a lot of artifacts introduced. And this is something we can actually, from the author side, at least up to a certain point, try to avoid. Um, just shortly on the channels, I will not talk much about the colors. Christopher has mentioned this already. Here, just an overview that you see this a little bit better. If I would, for example, choose um, red, green, and blue as colors of the individual channels, you see that here already compared to the gray version of it, nobody sees blue. So bottom line is don't use it because um, basically features cannot be distinguished. And you see that also for red, this is actually not very good. And I'm talking now about people who have no problem in vision. If we think about red, green blind people, which Christopher mentioned, then this will be horrible because they can't distinguish anything. So what is in theory a little bit better than that is um, 
if you use magenta, yellow, and cyan in combination, if we are talking about three channels, um, this generally improves visibility for everybody. It improves the visibility for red, green, blind people, and for printing, it is better. You will see this on the next slide. So individual gray channels, as Christopher mentioned already, optimum if you make merges, then cyan, magenta, yellow um, is kind of recommendable, but it also this has some kind of limitations. Um, here's something shortly on the printing. Um, what happens when you print something or when somebody converts an image for a printer, then normally this is what journals sometimes still ask you to provide CMYK images, which per se, in my opinion, is not the best practice because as soon as it's um, published online, the RGB version would be better. So if we are working with images on our screens, we generally work with red, green, blue um, combinations. And that always gives, talking about fluorescent images, a very, very nice, optical output. If this is converted, no matter with the software or by your printer, then basically the colors get dull. And um, this is not the only problem that occurs. If we are using red, green, and blue as a combination, then you see here in this yellow frames highlighted that actually features are changed and tiny features, which are the most important ones in the microscopy in most cases, are actually potentially messed up in your image. So this is what we want to avoid. The conversion from RGB to CYK is something that has this limitation. You cannot get rid of this. This is by nature is like that. But if you simply choose the color combination I mentioned, that will already um, leverage this a little bit and you will actually get less of those artifacts in, while the colors still are a little bit suppressed in this context. Um, so here, the only limitation that comes with cyan magenta yellow, if we combine red, green, and blue at the highest intensity, we are actually, we can show the highest intensity even in combination nicely. If we are using magenta yellow and cyan together, then the saturation is reached optically earlier. So if you have all three things overlapping in three channels, then it's potentially not so optimal to combine three channels then the best combination would be only combining two and showing rather multiple merges if you would like to do that. Um, and if you combine only two, um, something also shown and mentioned in the publication Christopher mentioned is then normally green and magenta is a good combination, which is very color mindful. Um, so now to a different problem. Um, and this is as soon as we make figures, what, what we often might need to do is you might need to rotate something. What happens more often and is, oft, or is definitely necessary is we might need to size change our images, um, for example, to make them fit into the figure panel at all. We often need to make the original images smaller. Or if we want to create some zoomed in inset views, or so we might need to make them bigger. The problem is, if you do this in a pixel-based software, then what happens is you can only make an image smaller by deleting pixels and make an image bigger by adding pixels. This means you are deleting data or you are adding artificially data. Both, you can imagine, is not very good. So this is why actually it's not recommendable to increase image or decrease image sizes in uh, directly in programs like ImageJ, Photoshop, GIMP, all those kinds of things. Um, and you will see how this solves later on in, in vector graphic programs. So what happens when we are doing these things? Um, on the left side, you see the original image. And if I take this and rotate it by 45 or by 30 degrees, you see, um, hopefully also in the screen share, that you are introducing artifacts into the image. Um, this is something which always happens. Now you might say, mm, I have rotated images in my life and I never saw this before. The reason why you didn't is because most software automatically runs interpolation over your image. That doesn't mean that it solves the problem. It just fools you and covers up the problem so that you don't see it anymore. Um, so what actually happens is or why does this happen? Because you cannot rotate pixels. The pixel grid is horizontal and vertically fixed. So what you try to rotate is your information. So that means it shifts against each other and leads to these artifacts. And the interpolation just filters your image, blurs everything, and covers it up. So that would be an acceptable solution for this normally. 
because in some situations you can also not avoid input. But if we can, it would be more optimal. So the bigger problem is, if I take an image and I make it smaller to make it fit somewhere, so here an image which has 10,000 pixels, 100 times 100, and then I would reduce it to 50% of its size, I'm, lead, I'm losing actually 75% of my data and I'm getting a super low resolution. Why do I lose 75 and not 50%? Because you go 50% down in X, 50% down in Y, what is left is 25%. So that basically would not allow you to keep much of what you are actually imaging. So bottom line here is, don't make images smaller in pixel-based software like Photoshop, ImageJ, and so on. Um, if you make images bigger, it's getting a little bit more complicated because um, if I take an image with 100 times 100 pixels and I, for example, increase it by a size factor of 2.5 leading to 250 times 250 pixels, then you see that these images look different and the right one looks strange. Um, so we are introducing, again, artifacts. Why? Because if I make a size change of 2.5, I would actually need to have half pixels and I don't have half pixels. So um, what happens, whoa, uh, one second. That is slides. So what actually happens is this. It takes individual pixels, and then by increasing it 2.5 times, it can only compensate that by taking one pixel, making four out of it, and the next one making six out of it, or dependent in the next row, making six or nine out of it. So you have everywhere an alternating pixel artifact in your image. Um, that is something we normally don't want to have optically as well. So now comes your software. It interpolates over this whole thing. Then your image looks super nice. It looks better than the original. And if something looks better than the original, you can guess it's problematic. Um, because what we actually would do in that case, we would fake a higher resolution. Um, because you would only get such a fine, fine grainy um, resolution if you would image this with a higher resolution magnification with a higher resolution setup. And that's basically also altering the data you have in your image already. Um, so in principle, when we would do this, and then we add interpolation, now beforehand you have seen that it actually would have made a block and give it the complete color of the original pixel. And now it actually takes one pixel, makes four, six, or nine out of it, and gives every pixel a different value. So it's basically massively changing us. Um, and that is something which might impair visibility um, of structures. So if we would look at this in multiple colors, then it's actually getting way better visible. So you see, if I take this image, I blow it up 2.5 times. So, so I make bigger pixels out of that. And then interpolation would actually interpolate over those ones and um, completely change the content of it. And this is only a 2.5 times change. Sometimes we zoom in more. So what actually happens if you would zoom in 20 times, then the left side is your original data and the other two ones are the ones you would publish. So, so this would actually massively smudge things. And if you talk about co-localization where the location of colors is very important, that can be quite deleterious. So um, what is the solution? The solution is using vector graphics for it. And um, Mike has mentioned this already. There is this amazing plugin from Greg Mesa, who is here in the audience already, which does most of the things as um, described already. So why do something again to reinvent the wheel? Um, it's simply a different flavor. No? So some people like it more restrictive, like get more organized. Um, what, what is very super about quick figures, for example, um, is that it automatically aligns all your images, it automatically adds the scale bar, it automatically pushes out the individual channels. So this is a super, super tool. Um, in Inkscape, you have to do some of those things a little bit more manual. 
Therefore, you have a little bit more freedom in how you are aligning these things. So it's a matter of taste, but both of those options, or actually also if the figure actually above all of those options are um, usable. So and what is different in vector graphic in general is that pixels are not treated as pixels. Vector graphic converts it, and this little square, which represents our pixel, is taken as the geometrical form. So it's just a square, and it's seamlessly resized or rotated. So we are not running into the problem that we would need interpolation or any other or get any other artifact. Um, this is meanwhile actually also reaching journals. So here is an excerpt from the Nature Protocols um, guidance where the journal itself already mentions Photoshop is not like super um, accepted from them and that they would actually like to have finally also vector graphics, for example, Adobe Illustrator, EPS or PDF files. Um, I personally would not recommend PowerPoint because PowerPoint changes your data as well a lot and you can hardly avoid that. Um, for presentations, okay. For figures, potentially not. The reason why the journal wants to have this is mainly because they need, they might need to adapt your figure again for their layout, for example, for printing. And if they size change your image and it's pixel based, they mess up everything in your figure. Um, and if it's vector graphic, they can size change it as they want to and it normally stays as it is. So, and here at this point, I would like to start showing you a few functions which you could use. Um, this might be a little bit too fast for the sake of time for following, but um, you can later on follow the video step by step or follow the longer video from the I2K conference. Um, so in case, for example, let's say you are having here, these are three images, um, multi-channel, four channels, three fluorescent channels, one um, DIC channel from a confocal microscope. Um, the scale bar is already in. This is already an image J scale bar. I will later on show you how we are adding this. Um, but basically, um, so that's our starting point. Let's say we want to show these three images in comparison in a figure. Now, one thing most people need to do or do before they start making the figure is adjusting the contrast. That's also a very big topic. And that's also part in the um, paper, for example. So important is, which many people are aware of, that you don't oversaturate too much in your images so that we basically stay inside that range um, our cameras or images give us. Um, and this can become a very tedious process if you have to adjust the contrast of four channels in comparison that it actually stays comparable and that you are not running into the oversaturation. And that's why actually um, in the biovoxel figure tools, um, you are having an option which automatically does this for you. I'll show you this here now for the fluorescent images and later on potentially also for the color images. If anybody later on installs um, the figure tools, this is mentioned in this forum post, how you can do this. You actually have after the installation here in Fiji behind in this double arrow, um, normally a function that says BioVoxel figure tools. And if you are activating this, you are getting a little image icon here on top. And this is the whole menu you actually need for it. So um, the first option I will not talk about, uh, MetaDirect stands for Metadata Recorder. It can actually record changes you do to your image and it will write it into the metadata. So later on it's there and you have the changes you basically would do written into the image. Um, this is something if somebody wants info on that, we can later on discuss this. Um, the LUT channels tool is a little bit a rewriting of the image J channels tool. Um, so the image J channels tool might be something some of you might know. This is here under image color channels tool. This is giving you basically access here to those images. You could here switch off and on specific channels, for example, um, or you could switch from the composite, so the merge mode to the original color mode, um, for example, um, and back. And the 
LUT channels tool from this option is principally exactly the same, just that you are having false colors available and you can quicker directly change colors of the individual channels. So, um, in principle, for this one here, I would like to switch off two channels. That is the first and the last one. Um, so I will switch them directly off that we stay with magenta and green. Um, and now you see already they are a little bit like fuzzy. So there is not the best possible contrast in the image. Um, and to actually adjust this, we are having in the figures tool the 5D contrast optimizer. So 5D because you can put in five dimensional images. So it handles multiple channels in a volume in a time series at the same time. What it does is it takes all the images that are open currently in your Fiji, or if you specify images from a folder, you don't need to open them, then it just opens them for you and it considers all of them. So that looks like this. Um, now at the moment, I'm having the images open already, so I'm not specifying files. What I'm doing is I say run on open images. The other way would, would I can show you later on for the RGB images. Um, so what this tool later on does is it runs automatically through all channels, all volume slices, all time frames in all your images you are having open and tries to figure out which is the image that has already the best possible contrast. And if this image is still adjustable, then let's do that. And it gives you the best possible one for this. And then it transfers this change equivalently to all the corresponding channels and keeps them perfectly comparable. So it's not like auto contrasts. Please do not use auto contrast for your images because auto contrast individually adjusts images differently. Auto contrast is not an option. This is an automatic function which transfers the same contrast to all images. So pixel saturation here, this is the amount in percent of how many pixels you allow to become saturated. Now, I said before, and we should not saturate or try to avoid saturation, but you will hardly be able to manage that no pixel in your image will become black or white. Um, and if you would not limit this here to some extent, and you would say, I want to have 0% saturation, then image J goes through the images and says, haha, I have found a black pixel. You told me not to saturate, so I'm not going to do anything. So this is some principle where we need to um, accept a small saturation and good is a value, you see this here below, which ranges between 0 0.01 and 0.1%. I'll choose now 0.1 that we see something at all. Apply contrast means that it will fix it in the image, so it's not revertible, that you later on also keep this and see this, and it will anyways then rename your images, and um, if you specify a folder, it will save it as the adjusted images in that folder. I'm not going to do this now because we are having them open. And print limits is just that you see the contrast it adjusted on the individual channel. So if I now press OK, the only thing you will see is that some of the images will be blinking. And they are all adjusted now. And in the log window, you will see which kind of minimum and maximum contrast adjustment values it actually has used for the individual channel for each of those images. And in addition, it is actually written into the metadata, just as a side information. If anybody needs to look at some point at the metadata of your images, in ImageJ, you can standardize do this under image and show info. And if you click on image and show info, then you will first get all the metadata coming from the microscope. And in this case, it will then at the bottom, and after all this metadata, it will then also here write in how the contrast adjustment was done. So you have it fixed. So we have it written in the image and can actually perceive it later on. Um, and now you might see if I open this again, the original, that there is to some extent a little difference between the two images. Huh? So um, now if I, so I have these three ones. And now if I want to basically make a figure out of that, let's say 
very common task is making insets so that we basically would select a frame and um, zoom into this region. Um, and generally people search for a region, then frame it and just resize this as needed. This is problematic because we are running into this half pixel problem. So, and to solve that issue, what we can actually do is in the figures um, tool menu is we can use the function create framed inset zoom. A create framed inset zoom is standard wise creating. Normally it starts at a factor of two. Um, so it will create a selection in your image, which you can position as you need to, but don't size changes as you need to. So the size change comes from the factor because what we are doing here is we are basically using a fold magnification. This is always an integer value. So we do not cut off pixels at some point. And then we can choose a size which is suitable for the object we would actually like to zoom in. Let's say, for example, here, a five-fold magnification for this nucleus. Then um, I can, for the aspect ratio, um, this is where I can choose, in this case, this doesn't make much uh, difference if I choose image or square, because the image is a square. If I would have a rectangular image, if I would choose image, then it would actually make a rectangular frame. Uh, they don't can have a look. Um, and you could here more artistically also make circle cutouts. This would potentially be only interesting if you are making a flyer for a conference or so and want to make a zoom as a circle, but otherwise we would normally go for um, squares. So then as Christopher mentioned beforehand, the frame should always be in the image fixed that we know where is the zoom in coming from. This is what add frame to original does. And if you would add multiple frames to one image, then you can also say, okay, I would like to add the frame to my inset and color it differently that I know which inset is coming from which region and the color I can choose here at the bottom. So let's say I'm trying this here now for two different colors. So let's say I make this blue um, and I make the frame five pixels thick. So this would be the setup. And if I now press create, what happens is it just gives me my zoom and it gives me the frame in the overview image. And now you see the original image has the same, or this image has the same size than my um, original one. And if I zoom in, then we see also that the data is now not changed. So I keep the pixels. The only difference is that here, one pixel is one pixel. And here, one pixel is a block of five pixels because I zoomed in five times. No? So what it keeps the original data. Um, so, and if I now say I need another frame, then I just grab this basically and choose, a, for example, here for this cell, a bigger frame, choose a different color. Press create and get the second inset. Um, so now since we zoomed in, now comes the thing with a scale bar Christopher mentioned. We should add a scale bar and the advantage in Fiji is if your images are scaled, which they normally are, if you save your original raw data in the original raw data format from the company of the microscope, um, then the inset will retain that scaling. So we can just right away add a scale bar and an image chain, this is relatively straightforward. You have a link also here in this figure tools. The problem is if you started from here, it doesn't really remember your last settings. So the real place where you find this in image tray is under analyze and tools and scale bar. Important to be able to add this is that your image shows micrometers at the white frame on top of it. If you don't see micrometers there, you will not be able to add a scale bar. So the metadata needs to be correctly readable or the information needs to be defined under analyze and set scale first. So here I have that, so I can run scale bar. Then you see it will add a scale bar here relatively small. Um, and then I can adapt this to how Big, I need this. The other scale bars in my case here now are um, 10 pixels big. My text size is, if I remember correctly, 30. 
Um, so basically, I can adjust this as needed. Can place in can change the color. Can place it in any um, corner I would need to. And very very important for the moment is that we are adding it as an overlay that keeps it later on accessible. So. Then I'm adding this and I do exactly the same for the other one. Analyze tools, scale bar. Now it remembers my settings already and will add it here. Now five is here a little bit small. So in this case, I could, for example, also add it as 10. So um, that would be my, for the moment, my preparation. Um, so contrast adjustment in different channels, creating insets and adding a scale bar. There is obviously more what we could do, but for the moment that should be. Um, something um, beforehand that Christopher mentioned is like, um, for example, check if a colorblind person can see your image. This is something you can actually here in this channels tool directly do. You can take any image and then there is a button which says here CDV test. CDV means um, color deficient vision. And if I click on this, it will directly show me um, a conversion um, because image they can simulate this. And then you see on top actually labeled no red. That means this is how your image looks like to a person that cannot see reddish color. The next one in the stack is how it looks like for a person that can't see green and the last one for a person that can't see blue. So you could in principle directly check it while you are choosing the false colors in the beginning. Sorry to cut in, Jan. I just want to mention that you have about five minutes left before the hour. We can probably go a little bit over because we were over when you started, but okay. some people will probably have to be leaving. So um, then basically, um, if you have multiple of those images, I would export them. So I will export all of them together. This is from the figures menu here, export all images as SVGs. Um, therefore, yeah, I can do this on this desktop, then you see how many there will be. So I choose here the folder where I wanna have a desktop. Um, in the newest version, you can keep these merge images as composites, then you could also still change the channel combination in the merge. Finally, um, I'll keep it now dependent on if somebody wants to see this later on. I can export all channels in grayscale as suggested. Um, I could also export all non-visible channels, for example, so the ones which are now not displayed. Um, and I can lock critical ROIs. That means things like the scale bar, which should not be changed afterwards, is basically will be fixed in the image. So if I now press OK, then you will see on my um, desktop, there will actually appear a lot of images. Normally I would do this in a folder. Um, and then I can actually start putting this into Inkscape. In Inkscape, um, So that's basically how Inkscape standard-wise would look like if you install it. What I would add on the left side or the right side or both is a few things. So what is definitely helpful here are um, the alignment tools. Um, this is here on top, the alignment button and on the left side, the layer tools. This is also here on top. Um, so would lead too far to explain exactly the setup now, but basically that you have a lot of options here how to organize it. And for figures, very, very important and helpful is Inkscape now has a grid alignment because your panels are normally uh, arranged in a grid and that makes it relatively simple. So now I'm dragging the images in here, trying to do that first for the Big images then for the insets. So this is one. And whoops. That is the other one. So and now you see advantage of this vector graphics is it actually preserves that. So quality of text stays the same, um, while pixels are also preserved, original data also stay the same. And the advantage here now is that we simply can arrange that very easily because we can 
take that. Then I go to the grid alignment. Now I know it's basically three. I want to have three rows. It were three images no? and five channels. Um, so I can specify this here in the grid panel. Then um, I can say I want to align to the center of the image. I want to set a specific spacing between the images. Hit the Arrange button, and here is your figure. Um, so that would be the first part. Then the insets. Um, you can do this also together, but I figured out it like somehow mixes the images at some point. And for the insets, I'm having two rows. I'm pressing OK, and then here are the insets. And at some point, I can select everything. And now I have 5 times 5 and arrange that. And the advantage of the figure um, of the vector graphic software is now it keeps those pixels. So if I take my whole graphic and I downsize it, it has no impact on the data. If we are later on zoom in, it will actually preserve all of this information. Um, we can still modify that. We can actually add labels also. Um, I would, if we have the time later on, or if somebody still wants to stay um, online, I can show that. But also for the sake of time, I don't want to go too much over it. Um, so that would be basically the, the starting point. Also, how you could export it. You export it into SVG, which means the scalable vector graphics. Go to Inkscape. In Inkscape, the arrangement, alignment, and labeling is relatively simple. Um, yeah, and now if you would say, for example, I don't like the merge in the beginning, I want to have it in the end, you move it over and say arrange again, and then it basically does that. So I think we can potentially, instead of me showing things nobody needs, uh, handle questions if there are others. All right. Do we want to open up the microphones or? And thank you for your presentation, Jan and Chris. That was great. Yeah, and as Greg says, um, if you want to have these things all automatic, then quick figure is the way to go. Um, if you want to have the flexibility of doing things somewhere different, then um, Inkscape might be helpful. All right, well, we do have a couple of questions from chat that I wasn't able to cover. Um, one question was the uh, size of images in Z-Stacks can be huge, especially when it comes to quantitative study. Uh, many free online database websites only allow for a lowly amount. I provided Beth's um, uh, plot, I guess, of various hosting sites, but uh, do you guys have any recommendations for sites to upload large-scale data to? I don't. And alternatively, uh, if analysis is done in 3D, uh, is there any recommendations for how to display the maximum intensity projection or similar in a publication? Um, if there is a way to show the maximum intensity projection. Of the 3D data, is that what you, is what, that what you would recommend? That's usually what I've seen. Oh, I think. Right. It's a uh, little tricky because the scale bars don't ever quite match up when you're trying to present three-dimensional data in 2D, but... I yeah, the scale bar for a projection would be the same, at least in the, the two-dimensional um, thing. But the problem is that you are combining, obviously, multiple layers. So if you will have small stacks with sparse data, I would say projections might be OK. If you have a lot of data, which will then combine, then most likely not. Then that's three-dimensional reconstruction. Or um, so we have that somewhere, or an orthogonal view um, would potentially be the the better solution. No? So we would have possibilities instead of making projections that we could use something like from image and stacks. Um, the orthogonal views where you could look at that from different angles that would be one option. Or something very, very nice actually uh, in um, image is a plugin called 3D Script from Bene Schmidt. Um, 3D Script is a super cool thing where you can directly make the reconstruction and you can make interactive animations with human language. And then basically you could take the same image, this one exported as SVG, edit to the figure. So 
simple, relatively straightforward. Very nice. Um, there was a question specifically for you, Jan. Uh, if you can adjust the contrast differently for each time point, or if there's an adaptable contrast per per time point with your plugin. In this case, not. So for this one, not. This actually tries to do it the same way for for each one um, to not alter this to keep it comparable. Um, if you would say like I have a problem of bleaching or so, and I would need to adapt it um, for each time point differently, then a bleaching correction plugin would be the better choice. For example. Sounds good. Um, let's see. There is a question in chat. Uh, if we resize the, the figure in Photoshop but exclude the resampling, therefore no interpolation of pixels is done, is that okay? Um, if you make an image smaller, it also doesn't help you because it will anyways delete pixels. If you make an image bigger and you switch off interpolation, then you will also get a good result, but only if you stick to an integer factor of size increase. No? So two times, three times, four times, five times bigger, then yes. And all of this to the question for these tools. Um, all of these tools are available as update sites. So if you run in Fiji under help an update, um, uh, in this update, you can install also the amazing plugin from Greg May. So um, quick figures, you can um, install these biovoxel tools. These are basically update sites with exactly those names. So that is all publicly available. Yes, and the links are in, in description, I think, is included in some of the uh, the emails and or the uh, links document that we've provided. Oh, yeah, Inkscape link is also here. Yep. So from my side, what I can offer, um, I have time, nothing better to do this evening. If anybody needs to see more, uh, I can do this. If not in this Zoom, then I can prevent present uh, a Zoom link with my own Zoom. Then I can. Okay. I uh, actually there's a there's a few more questions coming into chat now. If you want to take a look at those, um, I have never used Dragonfly or very, Amira very much. I have used Amaris to throw show 3D structures, but. I cannot comment on Omira or Dragonfly. Um, I think where you make your 3D reconstruction is a matter of taste, I would say. Obviously, there might be a difference in the quality of the reconstruction. I mean, typically, it is tools are specifically engineered to deal with larger data, I think. <clears throat> uh, maybe that's why they are a little bit different. Uh, uh, but usually they implement this very similar methods. So, yeah. um, To Darren Thomas' question with, I know it's dangerous with a gamma adjustment, yeah. Um, gamma adjustment in principle can be done in um, in in image chain. No? So you have under image uh, under process math gamma uh, where you could in principle adjust it. But I personally would also not recommend it no? because it's a nonlinear method. This is exactly what journals tell you already not to use. Um, so it's and if you use it, it needs to be somewhere described in the methods parts that people know this is not how the sample looked like. Yeah, Napari, clear volume, also good suggestion, also good, good option. Um, to, and to the question of those software, if they basically, because they create surfaces, no? so if we talk about a reconstruction, no? in such a reconstruction, you can anyway not really preserve the original data. So this is, a, this is kind of, um, yeah, so their surfaces, I would say, is, is perfectly fine.
And Jenny, um, yeah, so what this zoom in function actually does is it basically just blows up the region by taking the original pixel and then multiplying it with the zoom factor you were giving it. So you, you get a block. Let's say the zoom factor is five and you start with one pixel. So you are getting five times five, 25 pixels for each individual one. And all those 25 pixels receive the same color or same intensity. That's why it rich, that's why it still keeps the original uh, quality. And Greg mentions at the moment that Blender is generally for artwork and some structures and good for 3D reconstruction. This is true. It's a little bit more difficult to preserve your data there potentially, but I have seen on, on X, I tend to say Twitter still, I've seen on X a few days ago that somebody has created a plugin for Blender where you can read in TIFF stacks and can actually from there make reconstructions, which I think would be really amazing if that um, would work. But I have to look it up where, where this is. Uh, 